As we gather together, the Father is in this place as we have even come into this glorious music. Great is thy faithfulness to God. Be the glory. Great things he hath done. We celebrate today. We celebrate his presence in our lives, in the lives of the Hedrick family. Let us stand together and sing of his presence in this place and in our lives. In the presence of Jehovah, God. again in the presence of Jehovah in the everlasting. We come into your presence today to praise your name and to honor this thy servant, Dr. James A. Hedrick. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his calling to the work of Jesus Christ and for his marvelous ministry. We thank you for the investment that he made in the lives of the 
people of your church and in the lives of his students. And our Father, we pray that you will magnify that across the years so that in the ages to come, we each might see the exceeding riches of your grace in his life and our lives. Send your Spirit to comfort our hearts and to strengthen us. We thank you that Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago stayed on that cross, that this day we might have the hope that we have in him. And we offer this prayer in the matchless name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Because Dr. Lemke is having problems with his voice, he asked me to lead you in the celebration of the contributions of Dr. Hedry. I'm proud to do that, and I want you to listen to what God has done through Dr. James Hetrick. In 1963, God gave him a beautiful bride, Linda Marie Evans Hetrick. And together, God gave them three wonderful children, Angela K. Hetrick, Christy Lee Hetrick Robinson, James Douglas Hetrick. God led him to First Baptist Church, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where he was licensed, and to Second Baptist Church in Pasadena, Texas, where he was ordained in 1970. God enabled him to complete his doctoral degree in 1987, his master's degree in 1982, and his bachelor's degree in 1974 with a, with a major in history and minors in Greek and in music. Across the years, he has been able to sustain Dr. Hetrick so that he has received supervision training for the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. He received advanced clinical pastoral training in 1982 at the Southeast Louisiana Hospital in, Hospital in Mandeville, Louisiana. He received the licensed professional counselor certification in Alabama and in Mississippi. And as we all know, he's been a seminar leader in marriage enrichment conferences across the country. And he's also been a speaker at men's and women's retreats and conferences, parenting conferences, and children and adolescence conferences. We know Dr. Hedrick is the Associate Professor of Pastoral Counseling, occupying the Baptist Community Ministries Chair of Pastoral Care and Counseling here at our, our uh, School of Providence and Prayer, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. From 1997 to 1999, God used him as Assistant Professor of Psychology and Counseling at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And while he was there, he was the interim pastor of the Sagamore Hills Baptist Church in Fort Worth. From 1988 to 1997, God used him as the Senior Associate Pastor, Staff Coordinator, Program Director at Cottage Hill Baptist Church of Mobile, Alabama, and then as the Associate Pastor in Family Life and Biblical Counseling at that same fine church. From 1976 to 1985, he served as Associate Pastor at First Baptist Church of Kentwood, Louisiana, alongside our own Dr. Steve Eccles. From 1975 to 1976, he served as associate pastor in music and youth minister at Forest, Wood Forest Baptist Church of Houston, Texas. From 1961 to 1974, when he graduated from college, God used him in an assortment of ways, working in the churches, in music, youth ministry, family life ministry, and in a variety of ways that cannot be written down except in heaven. He served in the denomination in a variety of ways. He served in the local convention and the state Baptist convention. He received training in master life, continuing witness training. He was a disciple youth trainer. And we give God the glory and the praise for all of the accomplishments that have been ours to enjoy through this person, this fine gift given to us in the name of Dr. James Hetrick. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. After serving as a 32-year case study to my father to provide him with endless material for his classes, it's finally my turn to tell some stories about him. When Dr. Shaddix called me to ask me to speak today, I was uh, in my truck with my soon-to-be wife, Julie, and we were heading to the lake for a picnic. 
And after I got off the phone, uh, I immediately started thinking of the time that Jill and I were heading to see my Uncle Cleet, who was dying of cancer at the time. Uh, as luck would have it, we're barely in Mississippi, and my truck breaks down. And the first thing that goes through my head is, I need to call Dad. Dad was always there. It didn't matter where I was, what I had done, Dad would always show up. And sure enough, he came. I don't know what he was doing. I'm sure he was doing something, because he's always doing something. But he dropped it, and he came. He was always there. Now, sometimes he was there even when I would prefer him not to be there. Uh, I can remember I was in a youth group, and he had specifically told me not to go TPing one evening. And now, for those of you who don't know, TPing is when you take toilet paper rolls and you roll people's yards with it. Um, now, he told me not to go because we Hedricks have this sort of curse where anything that can go wrong is going to go very wrong. Uh, I don't just get in a little trouble, I get in a lot of trouble. So, of course, I, I went anyway because everyone was going, and this is what you do when you're an adolescent. Uh, and, well, as well, <laughs> I get arrested. And uh, everyone else got away, but I stood in the back of a squad car for two hours. And finally, the cop comes up to me and he says, uh, Mr. Hedrick, we're going to call your parents. Come get you. And I was like, you know what? Just take me to jail. <laughs> you know, let me do my time, and it'll stay between you and I. No one else has to know about it. Well, he's like, you know, well, we can't do that. We've already called him. So when Dad finally shows up, you know, I'm trying to slink into the seat of the squad car so he can't see me. And I see him get out of his uh, car, and he goes and he talks to the police officer. I can see they're talking for a few minutes, and the police officer starts laughing. And he comes up to me, and he opens the door, and he says, uh, your father told us to just take you to jail. <laughs> but we told him you had already made that request, and we denied it to you, so we couldn't grant it for him. And uh, on the way home, after a while, we started laughing at, how, at our uh, failed attempt to teach me a lesson. Um, if you're here today as a student, chances are Dad touched your life. Um, he had a knack for doing that sort of thing. Growing up with him, uh, he touched our lives as well. And I want you to know that uh, every morning, 4.30 a.m., regardless of how little sleep he had had the night before, he would wake up and he would go into study and he would pray for each and every one of you. He would be up before God praying for each and every one of you. The students here meant a lot to him. And when Dad was in the hospital, our hearts, as his family, went out to you guys as well. Uh, we had each other, but we thought about you guys, and we wanted you to know that, that, uh, that Dad, Dad loves you guys, and you meant a lot to him. Um, Dad's life was an awesome testimony, and his death is just as awesome. And uh, my prayer is as Christians that we all leave that sort of testimony behind us. Thank you very much. I'm going to read from Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, which describes how God used Dr. Hedrick to reach out to others, including myself. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. God used Dr. Hedrick in mighty ways to accomplish these things because Jim was a faithful and obedient servant. That was his heart's desire. He loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, mind, and strength, and he radiated with that love. And I believe that people were drawn to him because when they looked in those bright blue eyes, they saw a reflection of Christ's unconditional love and acceptance. Dr. Hedrick was a person with a gentle spirit, with a tender heart, and his gentle ways were soothing to those who were hurting. 
and comforting to those who felt broken. Dr. Hedrick cared very much for the spiritual well-being of his clients, of his students, of anyone that he met. He was truly a man after God's own heart, and he will always be an inspiration to me. And although my heart is weary with sorrow, I thank my God for blessing me with two godly dads and two precious families. God does exceedingly and abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. And I rejoice knowing that Dr. Hedrick is in heaven, dancing and singing with our Lord Jesus Christ, and that he is no longer suffering in physical pain. And I take great delight because each day, Jim shouts out to me, you go girl. (laughs) He is still my cheerleader. And I rejoice knowing that his legacy will not end. It continues as we remain faithful and obedient servants, and we submit our all to the one who is the Master Counselor, Divine Healer, and Lord of Lords. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you with a grateful heart, thanking you for bringing Jim into my life as my mentor and friend. And I pray that as I use everything that he taught me, that I will use it in a gentle spirit, and that I will always use it to bring you glory and honor. And Lord, I thank you for the Hedrick family, for the gentleness of Cody and Tyler, and I pray that they will continue to claim you as the Lord who loves his little children. I thank you for Linda and Angela, Christy and Doug, for their friendship, love, and support, and for accepting me as part of the family. And I pray that you will continue to wrap your arms of comfort around them now and forevermore. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's stand together. Who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do? Who could ever be more faithful to I will trust in you, Lord, I will trust. Who could ever be 
to respond. This is the word of the Lord from John chapter 11, Philippians chapter 1, and 2 Timothy chapter 4. May we read. Lord, if you would have been here, our brother would not have died. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me Though he may die, yet shall he live. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. May we pray. Our Father, this is your word, but Lord... These are our words from our hearts. We thank you upon every remembrance of this one we love. We're diminished by his death. But we're edified by the investment and inspiration of his life, ministry, and Christian character. Help us, Father, to so serve and run the race. And Lord, we thank you for the grace that you've given, especially to his family, and then to each of us as his friends. And Father, we pray that you will help us all to magnify your name and to glorify you in what we say and what we do in the short time we have. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
thank you so much, ladies, for that wonderful testimony and song. I was born and raised in the home of a funeral director and have been around death all of my life. But it never has gotten easy. It wasn't easy then, as a child living above the funeral home. is isn't easy now. When the phone rang at midnight and the news had come that Dr. Hedrick was in the hospital and in very, very critical condition. All of us know that death is a part of life. But sometimes we get shocked into realizing just how that, how vivid that truth is and how real that truth is. But we can be very thankful that we have a God who has made provision for death, who has overcome it, who has transformed the experience of it, who has given us encouragement and hope in the most difficult of circumstances. Many times during the last several weeks as I've thought about Dr. Hedrick and all that he has meant to me and to our seminary family, thought about the circumstances of his death. My mind has gone back to Psalm 90:12, that beautiful psalm uh, attributed to Moses when he said in uh, verse 12 of Psalm 90, So teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. It's a beautiful psalm about the meaning of life, wrestling with the realities of its limitation, with the difficulty that we often experience in the midst of it, with the truth of the matter being that we often experience the wrath of God against sin throughout the days of our life, or the whole world literally is encompassed with the penalty of sin all about us. And that in a real sense, God is delivering us from the affliction of life whenever He gives us the gift of death and eternity in heaven. But the word of the psalmist is a word of wisdom. A word that we are to live carefully, for every single day matters. And that is the truth that comes home when we face a circumstance like we've had now. This was not on anybody's daytime or it was not in anybody's expectations. It was a complete and total surprise to every one of us, family and friends and faculty and colleagues, even those of us who knew him only by reputation. We did not expect him to be taken from us in this circumstance And at this time, some questions might have come to your mind as they came to my mind. One question we always ask in times like this, where was God? And the answer is quite simple, with us. I suppose it is in the reality of the struggles and heartache and difficulty of life that the grace of God means more to us than all those wonderful, good, pleasant, happy days when things were going so well, you may have hardly given God a thought. But now you can hardly have a thought without God when you see the sense of loss and you see the suffering of grief and the heartache that comes from absence. The Bible reminds us in Hebrews chapter 4 that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is someone who has experienced temptation in all forms just as we have, yet without sin. And all of life's experiences, including the suffering of death, Jesus has experienced. And therefore, we are able to come to Him at our time of need and expect to find mercy and grace to help. For He knows the emotions of our heart. And if you have seen the movie The Passion in recent weeks and have been reminded through the very vivid medium of film of how real the suffering and difficulty of Christ was in that death, You know that when we come before Him with our own valley of suffering, He is very well able to walk with us through it. For He knows the cries of our heart. He knows the absence that we feel. He knows everything that we are struggling with and is therefore able to help us. And I have always claimed in times such as these that wonderful promise that we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When the Bible tells us the God who shined light out of darkness has shone in our hearts the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. For we are afflicted on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despairing. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but never destroyed. 
always bearing about in our bodies the death of the Lord Jesus, so that the life of the Lord Jesus might be made manifest to us. And in times like these, God has not abandoned us. Indeed, He is revealing Himself and His full knowledge of our spirit and our needs as He walks with us through it. A second question that inevitably comes with a death such as this one is, am I doing what matters most? For Dr. Hedrick had no opportunity to prepare. He had no opportunity to look at his last day and know that it was his last day. He had no opportunity to plan to do things differently than he might have done if he would have realized it was his last day. All he had was the Monday that God put in for it before him when he woke up and got out of bed and began his day. The truth of the matter is, we are reminded of how important obedience is. Actually, what God should find us doing whenever our moment of death comes or His second coming splits the sky when He returns for His church is a very simple thing. You ought to be doing whatever it is God wants you to do. Obedience matters more than significance. And the life that I think of, whatever I think of Dr. Jim Hedrick, is a balanced life. He always had time for his family, and Doug has shared with us that powerful reminder that his dad was always there. He always had time for his students and spent a great deal of time with them. He got his work done. He got his ministry done. He was a preacher as well as a teacher. He had a very full and busy and demanding life. But he was organizing that life on the basis of what God had for him to do. And you and I are reminded in a time like this how important it is for every day to be a day of obedience. You don't get the days back that you waste. You don't get the time back that you didn't spend the way the Lord wanted you to spend it. And so that time with family is always precious. That last hug, that last kiss goodbye as you walk out of the door always matters. Those conversations are important. Those time with students, you'll never get back again if you ignore or walk past that student you know you need to spend some time with. That time on the work when the project that God has given you to do, when you know it's something He sent you specifically to do, you must get it done now. Every single day matters. What matters is not the significance of what we do. What matters is that what we are doing is living out obedient to what God has for us. And if we are obedient each and every day, we will be prepared for whenever our time comes. Third question is past my mind in these days. And that is, what if I don't finish? I wonder how many things Dr. Hedrick started that he didn't have the time to wrap up. Things that he would like to have come to a conclusion on doing. Truth of the matter is, None of us really finish. Because it is not us that is at work. It is God that is at work. And He has given us a definite amount of time to work on the task which He has assigned to us. We don't know how long that time is. Dr. George Harrison was one of my favorite Old Testament teachers. Dr. Harrison taught Hebrew here for many years, and he was very difficult and very demanding. All you had to do to be ready for his test was to be able to translate the Hebrew text as easily as you could read English, to perfectly recall every word in at least three commentaries, and to know verbatim everything he said in class, and you'd be just fine for his examinations. And he was quite well known for very difficult tests. We were in a class of upper-level exegesis, and we came to the point for our first test, and Everybody finished in 30 minutes, and we were all stunned. We all just looked around at each other and said, Is a clone here? What's happened? Someone stole Dr. Harrison and left somebody in his place. None of us could believe the test that we had, because the, the last person turning the exam turned it in 30 or 35 minutes after it started, and the first person finished in 15 minutes. Well, we were all stunned and amazed, but grateful and thought maybe it was a brand new Dr. Harrison, that he had been converted, seen the light, and decided to be kind to his students. He came in the day after the test and said, now if you've had me for any other classes, you were probably surprised at that test. 
But he said, there are many people in this class that have not had me before, and I want to find out what your capacities are, how much you're able to do. This test was to fill you out. The next test will be a challenge. Well, I wonder what God has done with the days of your life to prepare you for the greater challenges that are there. And if God has given you some pleasant experiences and some happy times and some more easy times in order to prepare you for the difficult times that are to come. To find out your capacities. For He wants every one of us to fill up every day with the maximum amount that we can do for His kingdom's work in every day. He wants us to fill up every day with the maximum amount of nurture and love that we can give to the people around us every day single day. But He wants us to always remember He is the one who is at work. It is His work, not ours, that is our task. And as I come to my particular work as president of the seminary, I know there are things that I must do on my watch, but I will never finish everything that must be done in this school. Even as Dr. Level, my predecessor, worked hard day and night every day for 20 years, to do everything that needed to be done for the seminary, he didn't finish. But he did finish what God had prepared for him to do. And we are reminded that the clock is ticking. That you have a day less today than you did yesterday to get done the things that God had for you to do. Faithful is he who called you, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.24. Faithful is he who called you, who will also do it. God will get done everything He wants to do during your life and ministry if you will but give Him all of every day in which to do it. Perhaps the greatest reminder that all of us have in our experience of grief and loss and suffering is the reminder that the desire of your heart is not to be happy here. The desire of your heart is to be with Jesus and happy forever. You will never quite find satisfaction here on earth. As good as it gets, there will always be something missing here. The lady sang for us that beautiful song, I can only imagine, and that's all we can do right now. But the day will come when we will no longer need our imagination, and the experience is real. And Dr. James Hedrick's death is a reminder To remember where your citizenship lies. Not here, but in heaven. To remember where your family is going to be happiest. Not here on earth, but in that unbroken family circle in glory. To know where you're going to have no more tears and no more heartache and no more struggle. Never here, but always there. God gives us a warm-up through our physical life for what will be the unbroken sweetness of our fellowship in all eternity. We never know how long that warm-up is going to be. And indeed, sometimes that warm-up is so good and precious, we can't imagine it ever being any better. But the truth of the matter is, it will be. The very best day you have on earth, and the very deepest moment of intimacy you have with the ones that you love on earth, will be as nothing compared to what awaits for us in the glory of what will be. And as we celebrate the life of Dr. James Hedrick, let us also celebrate the fact that we will one day be together again. And it will not be a memorial service. It will be a glory, hallelujah, shouting service. And that Christ who won the victory over death has freed us from the worst bondage of all, the bondage of thinking this is all there is, for we know something better is coming. Would you join me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank You for all that You have done for us. You have removed the sting of death and replaced it with the hope of eternal life. You have removed the curse of sin and replaced it with the confidence of Your righteousness in our lives in its place. 
You have removed the difficulty of the unknown and replaced it with the certainty of a glory that is to be. We all thank you for Dr. James Hedrick. Our friend Jim, who meant so much to those of us who knew him as friends. Our professor who taught us much and modeled so well the things that we do. And our husband and father and uncle and brother. This man who meant so much to so many people. Thank you for every single moment you let us enjoy his life here on earth. We pray for his family that remains, that you would bear them up on eagle wings, Lord, in their time of loss and in the heartache of their grief. We pray that you would fill their minds more and more of the reunion that is going to be one day, that blessed day, that day that Jesus fought and died to make possible. We pray that you would comfort them with the assurance that there will be a sweeter fellowship than they've ever known before whenever they join Him in glory. May we live, Lord, with our grief, knowing that joy comes in the morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Doug, we'd like for you to come and join Dr. Spar and me at the platform. We want to give you some expressions of gratitude to pass along to your mother for your family. The first one is a letter that uh, I wrote after I convened a meeting of the tenured faculty members of the Division of Pastoral Ministries. There we were to discuss the possibility of granting Dr. Hetrick tenure. And after our meeting, I went back to my office, and on January 30th, 2004, I wrote this letter and sent it on to Dr. Lemke. And the letter reads, Since Dr. James Hetrick joined the faculty in 1999, he has been effective in interpreting principles of psychology and counseling in light of Scripture in order to help seminary students apply them in the churches and in other ministry settings. His effectiveness has been indicated in the syllabi and student evaluations for his courses. In addition, he has diligently extended his ministry to the churches and the ministers who serve in them through preaching and teaching and leading conferences. At the same time, he has taken seriously the vast administrative tasks related to his work as a professor. For these reasons, the tenured professors of the Division of Pastoral Ministries recommend tenure for Dr. Hetrick. We consider him to be the kind of professor who should be given the opportunity to flourish at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Signed, Argel Smith, Chair of the Division of Pastoral Ministries, and Dr. Jerry Barlow, Dean of Graduate Studies. Linda and Doug and Amanda and Christy, in recognition of the rich and the varied contributions Jim has made to our institution, our faculty has joined together and unanimously affirmed that the following resolution be presented to all of you on this day. Whereas James A. Hedrick has served the students and faculty of the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary with remarkable dedication, and where he taught his courses in psychology and counseling, counseled with hurting people, and led multiple family life and marriage conferences throughout this country with a passion to bring Christ into these ministry efforts. And whereas we remember him as a great mentor to students throughout our seminary and as a person of great integrity and courage, exemplifying our profession's commitment to the pursuit of Christian living now, Therefore, be it resolved that the faculty of the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary goes on record as recognizing the exemplary and loyal service Dr. James A. Hedrick provided. And, therefore, be it further resolved that the faculty of the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary hereby expresses posthumously its deepest appreciation for the time that we had with Dr. James A. Hedrick and for his numerous achievements and contributions in serving our Lord Jesus Christ and wishes to extend to his family our heartfelt sympathy for the loss that we all feel. We thank all of you for your willingness to share 
Jim's time and talent with us, and we pray God continued grace and mercy in the days ahead. And on behalf of Dr. Kelly, our administration, faculty, staff, students, entire seminary family, we have one further presentation that we would like to make to you, and that is that we want to present to you our commitment uh, to pray for you and your family. And we'd like to close our service uh, this uh, morning and by doing that. I want to invite you and your family and those that are with you, if you would, to come and stand uh, before this congregation of people that love you so dearly. And as they face you, we want to pray for you, and we want this prayer to be an expression of our continued prayers in the coming days. Congregation, I would have this, these requests of you as we pray together. Would you please remain standing after our prayer as we sing together uh, in closing the final stanza of Victory in Jesus. And then after we've sung that, we certainly want you to feel the freedom to come by and express to this family not only your sympathies, but your thanksgiving uh, for celebrating the life of Dr. James Hedrick. Let's pray together. Lord, your word says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around the table. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Lord, we thank You today for a life well lived. A life that exemplified what it means to walk in fear of You, to walk in Your ways. We celebrate again today, Lord, a family, a wife who's faithful, who exemplifies the same in a life that worships You and and serves You. Children like olive plants with deep roots. God, what a heritage. What an example for each and every one of us. Grandchildren. Lord, who follow in the same steps. Thank You for sharing with us Jim's life. Thank You for investing in us, this family. And Lord, before You today and before them, we appeal to You on their behalf that You would show Yourself strong to them in the coming days as healer, as comforter, as the One who provides continued joy in their lives. God, we pray that this journey through the valley The shadow of death would be one that draws them closer together and strengthens the bond. God, let it be one that strengthens their faith as they continue to live for You and to tell others about You. May Your presence be thick in day and in night. For us as family and friends, we pray that You would give us grace to remember to pray for them often, to call their names before You, but also to be the feet and hands of answered prayer, to walk with them and to comfort them and encourage them and to serve them. Together, Lord, we thank You for the realization of what it means to have victory in Jesus. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard man son, and he has built for me in glory. And I heard about gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing of them a song of victory Oh, victory in 